I'm here with a legend in the building science world. I know you love that, John. I love it a lot, yeah. <laughs> John Straub. John, I have learned a crazy amount of info from you over the probably 15 years I've heard, I've heard you speak. I really appreciate you being on camera with me. Glad to do so. Um, my buddy Kristoff and I are doing a presentation on a local AIA office, and uh, we're talking about hot topics in the building science world. Off the top of your head, and maybe even with what we've learned the last couple days, what are a couple things that you think are kind of bubbling to the surface in the building science world or just in the building world in general? Well, I mean, hot topics, I guess, are things like thermal bridging uh -huh. uh, and air tightness. Yep. And I would say that those aren't really in the building science research world because, well, that's been worked on for a lot of years, but yeah. now it's actually starting to get to mainstream. So people who are building buildings are now asking questions about how airtight they are. Yep. And with that air tightness comes how are we going to like do range hoods for rich people's houses with right. 1500 CFM exhausts? Totally. How do we do like the indoor barbecue and fireplace? So they're kind of connected, the air tightness and the mechanical ventilation side. Um, it had continuous insulation, and I would say this is probably not hot or new, it's but retrofit. How are we going to fix all the crap we've built over the last century? Uh, and you know, uh, sure, we're building a lot better buildings today, and on average, there's still lots that are below standard, yep. but there's just lots of buildings that have been built that need to be fixed is we can't solve the problems we have with just building new ones. Yeah, I totally agree. John, a couple of hot topics in Austin that Christoph and I seem to hear a lot about from clients. He does, He's on the consulting side, I'm on the building side. But, um, you know, I've heard a lot about mold these days from people. You know, I first learned about building science during the mold crisis and you and Joe are my main teachers. Uh, along with Mark Liberté 15 years ago now. But I feel like I'm hearing a lot now. The last two months I've had two clients come to me and the first thing they wanted to know about was what would I do for their house if I built it for them, knowing that mold is their number one issue. So if you think about the, what we learned about mold the last couple of days, and of course a lot of that was was kind of heavy duty research, but what do, you, what do you think about building a mold free house or a client comes to you and goes, you know, Matt, the number one topic is a mold-free house that's going to stay that way. What kind of things would bubble to your mind on that? Well, first I'd say I'm a bit uh, surprised to hear that it's becoming more noticeable. I, I mean, I thought that it was pretty well a concern across America already, okay? <laughs> so I'd say step one, okay, that. But it should be a concern, and I guess mm -hmm. partly what we heard today, but I think ongoing, it's, it's more than just mold. It's, yep. We should say, I'll help you with making sure you don't have a moldy house, but also what have you thought about dust mites? Have you thought about uh, pollen? Have you uh, thought about particulates, yep. et cetera? Yep. So it's really how do I make this the healthiest indoor environment that I can. Yep. And we have to work at changing the perception that indoor environments are less healthy than outdoors. Mm -hmm. Our challenge should be, surely we can make a controlled environment like a house healthier and more comfortable than outside. Yeah. And there's plenty of buildings out there that are neither more comfortable nor healthier than the outdoors. But we know how to do it at least better. So that should be the first bar. Let's do better than outdoors. And that means things like controlling humidity, filtrations, and so on. Mm -hmm. But you know those discussions I just said, hot top Topics are air tightness and thermal bridging. Well, guess what? They're directly connected to mold yeah, right. uh, in that those are reasons we might get mold. Mm -hmm. But the number one granddaddy of all mold is, of course, rain leaks and plumbing leaks. Yeah, that's right. And so that, was that a hot topic? I don't know. It's it not going away. It, it, it's got to be a number one priority of anybody building a building anywhere, yep. maintaining or operating a building is, how do I stop rainwater leaks? How do I control and manage floods uh, you know, from both plumbing and from outside? Yeah. Uh, those are still, let's not forget as we try and move forward, yep. the lessons of the past and what that needs to still be a full on effort for us. I totally agree. And as a follow-up question to that, you know, when I interviewed those clients in particular, they wanted to talk about alternate building systems very early in the conversation. Um, you know, let's talk about ICF or let's talk about, you know, SIPs or, SIPs or concrete or exactly. Where, where does that fit in this conversation, do you think? I actually think it's it's understandable for a layperson to want to jump to an alternate system because the assumption is the reason that what we're achieving is not what we want is because the system is wrong, right. and that's not the problem. Yeah. And you would only know that if you were in the business. You know, it's a lot more about design and material selection that's appropriate for climate for the climate, that's appropriate for the trade force you have available, mm -hmm. uh, appropriate for the size of the building, and all that stuff. That's what's missing, yeah. and it's and and sure. Some systems like ICF are really good in tornadoes, uh, but 
that's not the answer. Yeah. Uh, the answer is saying, being focused on what do I want to achieve and using the best of our knowledge to select the right materials and arrange them in the proper way to get that good performance. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, and last question on that same topic. Um, besides building uh, systems, there was also a lot of material discussions from those clients. Things like, should we consider MGO board or should we use fiberglass face drywall or should we eliminate those all together? Do you feel like the answer is kind of the same on those? Pretty much. I mean, yeah. there are situations where MGO board, actually, I don't know what it solves, so uh, whatever. You can use yeah. cement board or you can use MGO board. Uh, very dubious environmental qualities and certainly dubious technical performance, yeah. but it sounds cool. Uh, with respect to uh, fiberglass face gypsum board, absolutely use that in places where you can't avoid them getting wet, right. like pools right. and uh, hot tub rooms and, and greenhouse additions and so on. But if you need to use that in your living room, you've done a really big mistake in your design yeah, uh, right. that shouldn't be there, right? We got so, bigger problems. We got bigger problems. So it goes back to a lot of this is like design driven uh -huh. and choosing, yeah, those, it's great that we have those materials available to us on our palette. Lots of fancy materials, coatings, really wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why the job of design is even harder because we have to know how to choose those materials and where to put them yeah. to get the bang for buck we're looking for. Yeah. Blind uh, belief in a material, in a system, in an approach, it's never going to work. Yep. Hey, another hot topic for us in Austin. It's not necessarily at the top of every client's list, but I'm hearing more and more chatter about spray foam, and this is really bad, and I can't believe we're doing this, and have you ever done a house with spray foam, and what do you think about it? What's your general thoughts on this? Do you think that there's some some truth to the uh, to the claims that's, that all spray foam's bad, or, uh, or do you think that maybe in 10 or 15 years we, there may be some kind of ban on spray foam? I think the reason that spray foam is coming up more is because spray foam is now a real force in the insulating marketplace. Mm -hmm. And for many years, and many people in Texas would know this, but for many years, spray foam has been used for entire buildings in some parts of the country, like Canada, yeah. uh, particularly Quebec and Ontario. So literally 30 years ago, people were spraying entire homes with, with foam. Yeah, that's and amazing. so we have a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And it was just a small player. And now that it becomes a bigger player, two things happen. Happen. One is that you notice the failures more mm -hmm. because, you know, if it's a one in a thousand failures and all you do is a hundred houses, you don't know much. Right. But now that we do 10,000 houses a year in Texas with spray right. foam, well, you start noticing those 10 failures. Yep. Yep. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that there's competitive pressures and so now people feel under threat and so they start spinning stories and yeah. spreading yeah. both truths and non-truths. I mean, yeah. there are pro there can, you can screw up spray foam. I agree. Uh, but I would say it's also, I've noticed a few installations of fiberglass bath that were less than perfect as well. Only one or two? Uh, you know, I'm just saying. Uh, and so, literally, you can screw up anything. I yeah. think it is important to choose carefully yep. who's installing what foam, no doubt. Yep. Uh, but there's nothing, fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, fundamentally, there's a lot that's right with it, and it covers a lot of mistakes, actually, but it sure ain't bulletproof, just like any of those other systems. Yeah. You still need good people in using it intelligently. I totally agree. On that last topic, and frankly, I use a lot of spray foam, it's not a silver bullet, though. Um, you know, I've I, when I first started using open cell foam, we're in Texas, so for me, just about everything above grade, we spray open cell. Below grade, I certainly in wine rooms, yeah. moisture areas, we talk about closed cell, and occasionally we use closed cell in places where we need a real high R value per yep. inch. Yep. So in a retro, space. a retrofit I just did in 1876 house, we sprayed the whole roof closed cell, very little space. It also glued the heck out of the roof. It's super strong now. Yep. And I was able to do a really perfect air seal where that roof met a two foot thick stone wall. Perfect application for perfect it. Application. But you know, one thing that I that I kind of have found over the years is it's not the silver bullet that I thought it was when it comes to air tightness. And as I've been trying to ratchet down my houses as close to one ACH 50 as possible, you know, when I first started spray foam 10 years ago, I thought, oh, this is it. I've solved all my problems. And I'm not sure that that's that perception has been uh, eliminated in the industry. What do you think about that? I agree, and it comes from 
depending where you start from. If you're starting from a house that has seven ACH 50 <laughs> or nine ACH 50, almost any alternative approach to building that house will make noticeable and significantly meaningful right. changes. So you switch to ICF, and if you don't even do anything but switch to ICF, you're gonna be at like three or under. Yeah. And if yeah. you care a little, you're at two. But you're talking like one. So now when you start talking about one, you know, spray foam, ICF, uh, plastered straw bale, none of them are going to make it to numbers like one without real attention to detail in design and in construction. Yeah. And so that's sort of the difference. It's relatively straightforward to get down to three with just a few changes and a little bit. But as you start ratcheting it to one, yep. it really puts more emphasis. And so that's why we start seeing, okay, you use an exterior air barrier that covers everything. You know, but spray foam will easily get you below three. ICS will get you below three. Even SIPs won't get you below three without a little bit of detail, yeah. but they certainly can. Yeah. Um, and totally. But framed, we know how we get framed down to, to one. It's just a, uh, you need a continuous exterior air barrier and detail it fastidiously and it works. Well, yeah. that works on every system. <laughs> and so when you're trying to drive it down to a number like one and a half, one, or 0.6, if you like these German programs, yeah. then you are going to have to use both a good system and fastidious attention during both design and construction. You can't just do it during one. You got yeah. both have to be clicking on all cylinders. I totally agree. And, you know, that's that's been hard to get there. I mean, I've built a lot of houses and test them and got, oh, man, I kept thinking I'd be lower than this. I know. it's and and But the fact that you're talking about trying to get to one, yeah. you should recognize that that's already a major accomplishment. Yeah. Because, frankly, if you're aiming for one, you get 1.2, the world is not going to suffer and neither are your clients. No, it's when, you're, when you don't even care yeah. about testing your house to know that you're approaching one or two yeah. that's the problem houses yeah, so it's a good problem to have is not hitting one yeah. and missing it or not hitting 0.6 and going to 0.72 yeah. when you're weeping about how much effort you put in and missed pat yourself on the back because yeah. you really did achieve something special yeah thank you john i appreciate that any uh, any closing thoughts on hot topics in your mind and or interesting building technologies that you're seeing more and more of out there you know i would say that i'm seeing more deployment of technology that's been sitting around waiting for people to buy it for oh, a long time. Like so like better windows, you know, uh, people moving away from double hung slider leakers, uh, moving to casements and awnings, uh, people actually using triple glazed in cold climates, people actually thinking about putting shade over their windows awesome. in hot climates. So it's not and I really don't think we need fantastic products for a while. What we need are people to deploy what we already have and can afford to do. Yep, I totally agree. Last question for you as we're thinking about that. How do we deploy those? What's the way that we educate those next wave of builders? You know, I got into building science from the mold crisis and a builder I was working for had to buy back a bunch of houses. I was in serious crisis mode when I learned about building science. How does the average builder who's maybe 10 years younger than me and new in the business learn about building science these days? Well, I guess it is a really a self-driven exercise. I would like to say that the home builders associations in each city are going out there and trying, yeah. but I can't. Yeah. Um, but I would also say that builders are part of the puzzle, but they're not the only part. Sure. Uh, we need consumers to know about this. That's a big deal. If yeah. consumers don't know, they can't drive the whole market. Yeah. And also, of course, designers have to know. And I would include, how about real estate agents who actually have to sell products that are better and they don't know that they're better? Or how about appraisers who have to get mortgages on properties that are substantially better and lower risk, but they don't know it, so they can't actually get that? Yeah. And how about building code officials who are supposed to inspect alternate ways that are superior yeah. but different and they don't know? Yeah. So as always, I you know, obviously I'm biased as a professor. I'm saying we got to educate educate a lot more and a lot more broadly. And I think, sure, builders need to be one of those people being educated, but boy, there's a whole bunch of other players in this system, and some of them are way further behind than the builders are. Yeah, I totally agree. John, thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure. How can people get a hold of your teaching or your training if they're watching this video and want to see more from you? Uh, buildingsciencelabs.com. We have a lab, we have webinars every month that people can sign up for. Buildingscience.com remains a great resource for all kinds of housing information and high performance building. John, thank you so much. I appreciate your training, your dedication to excellence. I've learned so much from you. We'll see you at the 21st uh, Building Science Symposium, Building Science Summer Camp 2017.